Hello everyone and welcome back to Code with the Italians. Today we have two friends with us, Zach and Josh. Welcome. First time for both of you, right? <clears throat> yep. Yeah. Yeah, first time. Yay, new faces. Uh we have we are representing the whole of North America, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so um Today, we're going to be talking about uh, Circuit, which is something that you folks are working on and with at Slack, right? Um, so I think the first thing we, we need to do is I will let you introduce yourselves. And then when even he's back from wherever he's gone. <laughs> oh, he was the yeah. preparing. Okay. I see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay. I was work. I was working at it like three minutes ago. Just give me a break. Okay. Sure. Go. <laughs> okay, Zach. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I'm. Uh, hi. I'm Zach. Uh, been at Slack for a few years now, and uh, work from uh, New York City. Um, and uh, yeah. I don't, what, what else do I? What, what What else do I say here? Um, I. <laughs> You'll, you'll see a, a dog running around behind me at some point. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I led the project that started Circuit um, last year. And uh, yeah, no, we've had a lot of fun with it. Um, and now Josh is uh, our newest addition on the uh, Circuit maintainers team because we looked around inside of Slack and we're like, this guy's really good at Compose. Uh, do you want to continue working on this in open source? So, and with that, or yeah, let's hear from yeah. Josh. <laughs> Below. <laughs> uh, uh, based out of Vancouver, and I guess I've been using Circuit in production for most of this year, actually. So it's been really fun to build out and play with it and break it a little, to fix it. Been Slack a couple of years. Yeah. Excited to spread the word of Circuit. Nice. Uh, so before we continue, I think this is the time for Ivan to flex his marketing muscle. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Sebastiano. Thank you. Show us Thank what you, you got. Zach. <laughs> so what we got is the usual. So uh, you can support. You can support us uh, if you have an Amazon Prime subscription. You can uh, subscribe to our show um, for free. You can connect your. Oh, come on, Mark. <laughs> I gonna... So I can't do this in, in Spanish, so I need to I need to be better prepared for this. So bear with me. Um puede, puede, puede ayudarse. I, I, I don't know. Puede ayudarse. Uh, if, if if si tiene una Amazon Prime, how is in English uh, in Spanish Amazon Prime? Amazon Primero, whatever it is, I don't know. Uh no, primero I think is cousin, whatever. Um so <laughs> you can buy you can buy things like this. It's a keychain. You can buy the T-shirt. Uh, we are uh, getting the the designs on the new uh, match store. You can buy the the, the Angry Pizza T-shirt or the Need for Speed, the performance icons. We have a lot of stuff, uh, caps, mugs, and also dogs bandana. So if you if you're like into that kind of stuff, um, you can support us for um for for free if you have amazon prime again you can connect it to your twitch account every month you can subscribe to our channel for free we get we get like a few bucks just to print and send our stickers to our subscribers and also to bring them to conferences if you were in italy in london you know we gave away like a gazillion sticker yeah i'm out of uh, them so now. Th <laughs> yeah thank you thank you for the support um, yeah, let's do this. Let's do this, Sebastian. So, well, I'm not the one speaking. I'm the one that is going to start this whole thing by saying I've heard of Circuit. I have no idea what it is, what it does, but I know that intelligent folks are working on it and I want to learn what it is. And oh, dog. <laughs> yeah, I see a dog. Yeah. So, you you have to understand, Josh and Zach, you have to understand that we're, I work on documentation, Sebastian works on tooling. But we kind of don't don't do that. I mean, we 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 don't like to read documentation and try out stuff. We <laughs> get people on the show to actually teach us. So that's what we we leverage and we exploit. I would say we exploit. We exploit. Uh, that our sounds friendship. bad. 
Yeah, that's why I meant that. Do you we know, synergize? I went for a specific... <laughs> yeah, sure. That's uh, went corporate very quickly. But the reality is that we like the fact that you know we don't know stuff. We we get uh, people over to talk about the things that we like and we we think that are uh, relevant to the community. So you know that we have also have a video memory of an introduction to the to the topic. So Sebastiano just told me, oh, we have a couple of friends coming over on Wednesday. I have no idea what circuit is. <laughs> so I'm like the, the average Joe here. Like, okay, that sounds cool. <laughs> they are having fun, but what it is. Yeah, uh, I guess I can, I can take a crack at like a, a brief introduction to it. So um, I think a little bit of historical context is probably helpful for this. Um, for the longest time at Slack, we had an app architecture that was basically like, MVP plus Rx Java, um, you know, what everyone had been doing since, I don't know, 2016. And um, it was starting to show some real, like, uh, rough edges around it when we tried to adopt new things. So, you know, coroutines comes into the picture and it's like, oh, we can, we can interop easily. That, that's fine. And then compose comes into the picture and we're like, we can drop things into an Android view, maybe, but we had this whole pattern of like making views implement an interface and like that, you know, immediately like runs into a wall with Compose. Um, and uh, there's some other things in there too, like, you know, view models came into the picture and we were like, cool, uh, should we use those? Should, should we not use those? If you, you know, want to start a flame war, you just drop that into like Kotlin line Android channel and see what happens. Um, yeah, and so we, uh we were running into this point where we were like we need like a a good uh consistent uh architecture for the app that is not just us continuing to bolt things on to mvp and rx um and so we did a small working group of about four of us um starting in like june of last year to basically try out different architectures, look at what was you know available off the shelf, so things like uh, Mavericks or Square Workflows, um, the sort of like standard Android uh, best practices. Like if you go to like d.android.com/architecture, like what were they advising there? Um, and then we also were talking with a lot of people that we knew and liked in the community. So particularly people like. Uh, Adam Powell on the Android uh, UI toolkit team, framework team. Adam, if you see this, please clarify. Um, and then uh, also a lot of the people that we knew over at uh, Cash App. And the TLDR is out of that, we decided to write something custom that is very heavily inspired by uh, basically just things that we liked from all of those different uh, places that we looked at. Um, it's particularly uh, inspired by uh, Cash App's Broadway architecture, which is not open source, but they have talked about it at a few conferences now. Um, and uh, kind of taking that and uh, applying a lot of the things that we really liked from talking with Adam and things that we liked in uh, you know, these other architectures that we saw and things that we knew that we needed on uh, the internal Slack side of things. Um, so we started building Circuit. Um, it actually initially started as a branch called Newark in a separate project uh, called Catchup so that it was public so that we could share with the people that we were talking with about it and get their thoughts on it. Um, and then we very quickly spun up an open source project for it. We wanted to develop it in the open from the get-go. We benefited a lot from being able to like take what we were working on and then like go and like shop it around and show it to people and be like, hey, like. Do you think this makes sense? Do you think this doesn't make sense? Um, and yeah, it we it grew pretty organically from there. Um, we got the API to more or less where it's at um, today, starting in like, I don't know, end of October last year. That's when we made it generally available to use inside of Slack. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of like a quick like timeline of it. Um, and then the architecture itself, we had basically like a set of requirements uh, from the get-go of like whatever solution we ended up with needed to hit. And that included a few different things of like, 
you know, we want to use compose. It has to be something that is maybe not necessarily compose first, but compose has to be, you know, not, not bolted on like we were doing before. Um, we wanted it to be a uh, UDF or unidirectional data flow. Uh, we had been adopting that inside of Slack for a while. Uh, rest of the community is, um, I think more or less, uh, not adopting maybe like en masse, but it's definitely like a recognized and like uh, favorable pattern that we see elsewhere. Um, Compose obviously lends itself really well to this because it's like, hey, just send in a state object back and it just renders that and you have this sort of very functional contract. Um, we you know, wanted to uh, make sure that it was like compatible with a bunch of different technologies that we wanted to use where like coroutines is like built into Compose. Like it, a lot of people think of it as like, a, oh, it's like Rx or coroutines. And it's like, you can actually use coroutines without any multi-threading whatsoever. Um, and Compose does this all the time, especially if you do gesture animations and it gets, that really tests uh, <laughs> your coroutines knowledge at times. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so we had sort of this like yeah. set of requirements. We wanted things like navigation to be sort of dead simple. We really, really liked how uh, Cash App's Broadway architecture handled navigation, where it's just like, you have a navigator, you call go to screen or you can pop. And that's that's kind of it. Um, and then we like married that with this implementation of a back stack that um, Adam Powell shared with us that uh, is basically like a savable uh, list that you just put all your screens on there and then that's sort of it. Like there's nothing super complicated about it. We wanted navigation to be simple by design and kind of like keep it that way. Um, so we had this whole like burn down list of different things. And uh, we started with uh, pretty like bare bones APIs of like, this is how we want it to look. And then we'll figure out how to make that work in the end. And uh, I guess we'll go into some code examples of that later. So it's not too hand wavy, but um, we were pretty happy with it. We took some uh, not controversial decisions, uh, but some, some interesting ones about how we handle, say, like event flows um, through it. Most of the time, whenever you have some sort of MBI framework, there's like state goes this way and events are carried this way. And the framework does the shuttling of both of those. And we actually only do the shuttling of the state and events actually are implemented as like a callback uh, or like a function inside of your state so that you can treat your state as like a continuation back into your presenter. Um, yeah. What? I don't know. What? What am I? What am I missing here? That's pretty much it. It's like we wanted this nice, lightweight, fairly clean framework that we could use and start with to get away from this old 2016 style of architecture and really set us up for the next few years at Slack to build some cool stuff on Compose, which we're doing. We do have a. We we do have a bit of like a a magic sauce in there that. We didn't yeah. quite realize how good it was going to be until more or less like it, we were like beaten over the head about it by people externally in the community. They're like, no, 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 this is really good. You should really run with this. Um, Josh, do you want to explain the, the circuit retain stuff? Yeah, so we put some cool stuff to kind of get around I mean, the classic Android problems of like configuration changes blowing stuff away. And part of that being this retain stack and is this hidden architecture magic in the background that's going to track um, on a remember and compose and retain that through configuration changes or whatever. So that's been expanded on and built on to the point at this time where you can go forward a couple screens and come back and all that state can get retained, which is really powerful. And on its own, it's really powerful in like just standard compose, but putting that inside of your presenter to track your own state and come back to a screen like exactly where you left it. It's been, it is very magical. Um, and we fixed a couple of bugs in it, but it's working really good for us right now. It's, it's kind of one of those nice, like you forget you're dealing with Android moments, which is awesome. That's a pretty big claim. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm very curious to see how like this works, and maybe we can go over the implementation as well later if you have if we have some time, because uh, I'm very curious. So that sounds kind of like the the holy grail of. Oh, you know, you don't have to care about the really annoying stuff that everyone forgets at some point. <laughs> yeah, no, we yeah. we had this sort of hierarchy for how we save state that um, 
I think ended up in a pretty good place. Um, it started as like, yeah, we wanted to handle like, hey, like when I rotate, put it back. And I want to be able to use something other than remember, remember savable so that I don't have to make it parsable every time. It was like a very sort of like Android specific narrow view of it. Um, and then uh, with the help of uh, sort of community feedback and uh, most notably Chris Baines uh, contributing this sort of broadened implementation of it, uh, it now ends up being this really nice way to like wormhole across uh, screens on your back stack. And the way that we treat this uh, state hierarchy is like um, at the very you know top level, you've got just like a standard compose uh, remember. And it's like, remember this in the composition. And then when the composition goes away, it's gone forever. And then the next one is like, do you care about this, you know, on your screen when it's on the back stack? Do you want it to be there again? Um, when you rotate, do you want it to be there again? Kind of thing. And that goes in remember retained. Um, and then at the very bottom of that hierarchy, you've got remember savable. And we treat that as I think that if you go and look at like standard compose docs, it kind of tells you like, hey, if you want to retain state um, in general, put it in remember savable. And we actually treat it as if you wanted to survive process death, put it in remember savable. Otherwise, we actually stick with remember retained uh, for the most part. Um, and that hierarchy seems to basically just work, which has been nice. Knock on wood. Um, <laughs> I mean, I would guess you're, in production, so. you're very much in production with it now. So if, yeah. it, if it works for you folks, it's probably good enough for most. For most, yeah. yeah. It's being able to decompose your state like that, as opposed to just the sort of catch all, like I'm going to do in a view model. And in view model world, I can just not think about what happens because it will, you know, it will be the, uh, I have a coworker who had a great line for this, just an arbitrary retained bucket. Um, and you know, under the hood, actually, in Circuit, uh, this this is the the big reveal. It does use a view model to make remember retained work, but only on Android. Um, <laughs> and we hide it completely from the users. Uh, it's not something you have to think about or know about. Um, yeah, it's a uh, yeah. I don't know. That's been, that's been turning into like a magic sauce. It's it's really useful that we're not relying on savable for a lot of this because this makes the multi-platform part of this way easier. Just use retained. Yeah, that, that was, but. that was my, my question because you, Zach mentioned only on Android. So I'm assuming that the library is multi-platform. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And that's why, it's... that's why you, you're kind of staying away from things like navigation on Android, you know, and, and specifically view models and things like that. So it's a, it's a bit of, going for uh, like a bit far to to get a broader audience i want to say because if you want to be multi-platform you you have to be a bit more like you know uh higher from uh from the tools that you that you want that you want to use yeah. i like i like the fact that you went straight to the community to get feedback that's at the same time very brave and very <laughs> very like risky because you know people 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 are the worst, right? So, <laughs> especially in what we do, right? Everybody has an opinion on everything. So, you know, that's that's actually very brave that you go there and say, "Oh, do, do you like this? Does it make sense?" So, I I understand that you probably approached like a, a safe circle of uh, friends, <laughs> and not just, "Oh, yeah, let, let's go on Twitter and ask." Uh, yeah. But, but but yeah, that's still still great. I think it's a it's a nice also uh, you know story to to tell from a community point of view. Yeah. No. The I should clarify that on the multi platform front, um, we did it out the gate mostly because we wanted to be able to write our uh, tests in like purely JVM. Like we kind of imagined this world where say you could write your presenter in a completely Android agnostic mm -hmm. way. And then that project can uh, sort of run anywhere, like or anywhere on the JVM at least. Um, and, you know, we had some other ideas around you know, the way that we've like modularized a lot of the artifacts that are in it is like, you know, you could in theory have like your JVM only presentation logic uh, project and then like a UI project separately. And then somewhere down the line, circuit stitches those two pieces together um but that was initially the goal with it with the sort of eye 
toward like, you know, in the future, like if we do ever want to do more in the multi-platform front, um, this keeps that door open, but just even supporting Android and JVM gets us, you know, 95% of the work to supporting multi-platform in general. The rest of it is mostly like, how do I convince, you know, KGP in, you know, to set up these targets and, um, you know, that kind of thing. So now we're at the point where we support, um, uh, Compose desktop uh, slash JVM. We've got um, the new iOS alpha um, and we have uh, uh, JS support. Um, the, the way that each platform works is a little bit subject to, for lack of a better word, like prioritization. Um, obviously, Android is our main focus because we do Android, um, and uh, our iOS team is is not adopting this and not looking to adopt it. Um, I mean, we, those people, right? Those people. So I they're mean, all the the same everywhere. Yeah, their their tooling is already rough. I don't know if they want to add yet another one in there, but yeah. um, <laughs> the uh, on the iOS side, um, I think that one thing that we've kind of struggle to understand is what the right like boundary is for that. Um, like in iOS, do you want to have, say like writing presenter logic that is shared and then have it fan out, you know, have some sort of like adapter layer that then gives you a state object to like native Swift UI, which was kind of what I was thinking it would work as, but then in practice, people in the community that have been tinkering with it, particularly Chris Baines again, have been like, no, just like, write everything in Compose and then ship it on Bolt. This is also more or less what Compose um, iOS support that JetBrains is working on kind of leans into. Uh, you know, maybe someday in the future they'll add like a like a Cupertino mm. theme or something like that. But at least right now, like that's it. It works. You're going to have the least amount of headaches if you just try to use the Compose UI everywhere. So. Oh, maybe there's some future where we support both, um, but that's kind of, it's sort of out there and available, but we're not doing anything with it internally uh, currently. And then same thing on like the JavaScript side, like we support it, uh, but we're not currently using any of it and just sort of, you know, looking and interested in feedback. So if I, I don't know if this is a question you can actually answer, but, uh, what do you think it would take for other teams uh, in Slack to adopt Circuit or, or something like that, even not necessarily written in Kotlin, but I guess that kind of needs to be um, because of all the Compose stuff. But I, I guess, like, as you said, you had to do 95% of the work anyway to, to have desktop support for testing, which is fair enough. Um, would you like other teams to use it? Or, and if if so, what, what would you tell them? It's like, why would you, how would you sell it to them? Difficult question. Josh's team is the one that's done a prototype. So yeah. yeah, I think this is a, one of those ones where it, it gets into a bunch of politics really quick mm -hmm. inside the company. It is a technology, and we try to like pitch it as a technology that people can use. We've used it in some of our internal tooling on the Android side. But there's enough sort of inertia already, I think, in a bigger company like ours where it's really hard to be like, hey, go change your whole architecture a little yeah. bit to throw this in. So, I mean, we'd love it. Um, there's a lot of other new technology with like Compose on the front end of that. So my, maybe not right now, but I think the general approach of doing UDF is mm -hmm. something that we share and we'll work towards. And I, I think that's a better common ground for the moment. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess the better question would be, which principles that you adopted in circuit are also used or yeah. usable by other teams? Yeah, that general UDF approach and, and building state, and that's kind of gives you this compounding testability mm -hmm. and improvement. And you kind of know what's going on uh, approach is the like winning thing we're seeing on the Android side. And that's sort of what we would pitch to everybody else. Here's mm -hmm. some. Got it. Yeah, Slack has done cross-platform library, like shared business logic uh, adventures before, but it I would categorize it as a misadventure. Like we we did a blog post sort of about our you know what we learned from it uh, in the process of sunsetting it, 
it was a few years back at this point, but it's like, it's not necessarily that uh, engineers or management are against the idea of shared business logic. It just has to have a really compelling uh, value prop. Um, and that adoption aspect of it is, it's like a giant unknown when it comes to Compose multi-platform still, um, and to a lesser extent, uh, call them multi-platform. Um, not so much on like the tooling side maybe there as much as just, you know, it's a new language to, to people on those platforms. And uh, a lot of times when we look at, you know, opportunities for this, it's for things that already have existing implementations um, where, you know, it's, it's harder to justify saying, hey, let's go rewrite this in one language and then we won't have to have it written in three languages. But you're saying that after it's already written in three languages and they're like, why? You want to write it a fourth time is what you're saying so yeah. it's <laughs> yeah it's old xkcd uh, yeah <laughs> there's some there's some codflow multi-platform stuff we've experimented with for some really like heavy computation math stuff where we just want to like really write it once mm -hmm. and there's been some uptick on on trying to get that in because that kind of makes sense but that's for new features again it's not there's inertia you have to overcome for all this yeah I mean, uh, mine was mostly a curiosity because I know that that is a fairly common uh, problem when writing Kotlin multi-platform is that you either have organi or organizational inertia or there's always the, if it's not something new, then you're rewriting something that is already there and probably already works well enough. So it's difficult to justify. And uh, I was wondering if there was something and i guess yeah that what what you just said josh is like there's a specific very specific application for which it might make sense uh and then yeah that then there's value there because you don't have to go insane on hard maths multiple times <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah um, no, it's a go uh, ahead Sorry. i was gonna say it, it it's a uh, the did that uh, project ship anywhere or I know the prototype no. for we're having to be like cagey about how much we say that but yeah <laughs> it, it's a fun little prototype that's been around but yeah I, I think up. it's I think it's safe uh to say this part of the story um the uh the TLM for that uh was really fun to talk to he was very supportive of it um and I think even comes from like an iOS background so like that actually yeah. kind of like helped um kind of i don't know just put some like gas in the tank for this um and he had a really funny uh sort of ambitious mindset of like we'll build a prototype and then it's very hard to you know if we want to take this forward it's very it's a lot more difficult to say no to a working prototype um than it is to just the idea of one or rewriting existing stuff because in this case it's like we have a prototype and do you really want to make so and so on this platform have to go and do it again <laughs> separately? So uh, it's a uh, there's some nice like ambitious mindset um, in the management side of this that has actually been refreshing to see. Sort of a ask for forgiveness kind of attitude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And in my experience with with clients uh, working product, you ship it to production. That's that's <laughs> but it works. But no, no, this is just a demo kind of prototype kind of. I mean, you build it, it let's ship it. I was like, no, no, no. Uh, but yeah, but yeah I, I can understand. Um, okay, so Sebastian. Yeah, sorry for the tangent. I, I brought you all off <laughs> on. Let's go back to circuit. Sorry. <laughs> no, but it, it's actually it's actually in, it's super legit because you know you, we have seen this, and I'm having also an experience, uh, multiple experience with this. You know, multi platform conundrum now lately and uh, yeah a lot of ideas and, and, and opinions changed in the last few months are you gonna uh, use the f word to... we don't use no the f -word. i'm not gonna use the f word i'm not gonna use the f word uh <laughs> but again i i i see the struggle with um you know the selling part for kotlin multi-platform and 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 compose um compose multi-platform that's even even trickier um so do we let, let let's see something like yes working sebastian let me <laughs> i mean i don't know i don't want to venture all the way to working but at least 
you know, looking at how it's done, that, that, yeah. Showcase, <laughs> showcase. So, um, in terms of setup, so if you think about someone is going to write a compose application and they're going to go with the classic view models based architecture with UDF as you're supposed to do with compose and how compose kind of forces you to do anyway, um, which is what I've done before. Like what would I need to do differently? What is the, how do I get started? How do I learn how this works? Yeah, I guess that's kind of the, is the fun bit is you can kind of throw away the view model in, in a lot of that. Um, but you kind of take in that view model, you're going to produce a bunch of your state and mm -hmm. you take all those parts that you're putting together and you're probably, I'd say most of the time in those view models, if you're doing one state object, there's some weird combine in the flow there that's like throwing everything together. The thing we found in set Slack with circuit is you can take sort of whatever that combine is and that just turns into your present function mm -hmm. inside your presenter. So you throw away the view model, you bring all your data and you produce your state inside the circuit presenter and you just output it and kind of like clean it up a little bit in a lot of ways. Got it. So um, you, do you still work with, for example, in a view model, I would probably expose state flows or something or, or maybe state directly. Uh, how does it work in in circuit? What what do you do? So the I guess the core yeah I just skip over this the core of that circuit presenter is it's running on the compose runtime. So you have one present function that's composable, ah. and it outputs the state. Oh, I love and that. that's that's <laughs> it. It's really clean in that yeah. So you just kind of build your state object and it runs through and you output it. Ooh. Okay, I'm gonna. Do you wanna... I have the. Homepage open on my screen. Sure. I can share that, and then probably yes, that's gonna be helpful. Uh, there you go. I was just about to suggest that. I think we're at the point where we need to look at some code. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm starting to <laughs> to get a bit lost. I'm gonna share it on Skype for you folks as well. Like itchy, itchy hands. Yeah. Uh, but but no. But I but have states here, and it goes that a, 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 <laughs> Yeah. A, a stupid question. A stupid question uh, about existing projects. So I can add this to uh, like a normal Android app, right? So do I need to do like a anything different? Like, do I need to convert it to? I don't know how Kotlin multi-platform works. So mm. is it just like a Gradle? Thing, the Lego the Gradle dependency that I can add in my Android app, or do I need to do something fancier? Yeah, so since it's just a standard um, multi platform dependency, um, as long as you're using the Kotlin Gradle plugin, it will automatically pick the correct target for your project. So if you have an Android project, it will pick the Android uh, versions of things. Um, yeah, so it's like using, you know, OKIO or SQL Delight or any other multi-platform project. There is a bit of like, in, in terms of actual code, there is a bit of like one-time upfront scaffolding that you have to do. Um, at the end of, uh, or at the very beginning, it's like you have a, what's called a circuit object. It's just a class called circuit. Uh, if you've used retrofit or Mashi or uh, anything of that nature, like it's just, you know, that's your entry point. And then it has a bunch of different uh, factory classes for producing presenters or UIs. Um, you write those, you know, elsewhere in your code base. And then we use a little bit of code gen to simplify that. Um, and then we put them all into this circuit object. And then um, your primary entry point in terms of compose is something called a circuit content or if you want navigation in a back stack we have a navigable circuit content mm -hmm. and basically you just give this composable function your circuit instance um, or provide it as a composition local and a screen that you want to go to or the back stack that you wanted to show and then you're like that's your like jumping off point and you're in circuit for the rest of uh, that ui cool Thanks. So 
I guess setting up is yeah usual stuff. Um, this is the circuit instance you were mentioning, right? Right. Yeah. So the the result of so the builder. The add favorite UI factory and the presenter factory, those are like, that's a screen that you want to build, right? Can I consider the, it as a screen? Yeah, we, we've had to change the, the nomenclature for this a couple of times. We used to call a collection of these a circuit and then people kept calling them screens. So now we call them screens, but there is a contingent of people inside of Slack that are calling them circuits again. Um, the uh, Generally, Maybe we call them screens. Maybe sorry. Yeah, um, but we also have a class that is called a screen, and that's like your navigation key. Um, so it's it's yes, both. I don't know. <laughs> no, but yeah. from uh, from uh, uh, because I'm I'm reading the snippet, and I don't think there was a mention before this lines about the add favorites something, right? So there is a. There is a yeah, that's just an example in this. Like if you have okay, a screen. Okay, but it's an example of a of a screen, right? So that's how I need to yeah. think about that. So for, yeah. for a screen, we are adding a UI factory and a presenter factory, correct? Okay. Yeah. Where yeah. the UI factory, I guess, is the one that has the composables for the screen. Yep. And yeah. the presenter factory is what you were saying is the present composable function, essentially. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So the, this presenter factory is replacing the view model? Or, or uh, not? <laughs> sort of. I guess I guess in like classical Android sense where that's where all your logic is to output okay. your state and build your state, it is. And okay. yeah. And then the factory pattern that we use here is just in an abstraction layer so that yeah, it makes it easier for dependency injection. You can also uh, do clever things with like delegation. So if you've ever done uh, things in like uh, retrofit or Mashi uh, where you like can decorate uh, real adapters and then uh, do other things like tracing, for example, is implemented this way. Mm -hmm. um, but the factory itself is very simple. It just you know, it says, here's the screen. Um, do you know how to create a presenter of this type? If so, it returns it. If not, it just returns null and it tries the next one. I see. We don't generally write these factories by hand. This is where our code gen comes in, but that abstraction layer is there for flexibility purposes. Got it. So going back to the example, the first thing I do is create the, the circuit instance with the, both the factories. Uh, and then, so it sets up a composition local for that. Uh, do you, like you were mentioning, you could also pass it directly, but uh, is there any reason why you would go one way or the other? You would usually want to do the composition local. Um, so the circuit content function that is, can I annotate on this if I click? No, okay. Um, <laughs> the the circuit content function here has a parameter for a circuit instance that just defaults to the composition local. Oh, I see. So you just it just saves you from writing comma circuit everywhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of things. So it looks like, yeah, you have everything. Every feature is available on every platform. I guess. Yeah, with a couple of caveats. There's some places where like a feature is supported, but Compose multi-platform itself doesn't do anything. So like mm -hmm. savable is only really implemented on Android, but the APIs are there and you can like throw stuff at them and they'll just be like, cool. And then drop it on the floor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's uh, good to know. <laughs> um, so, Okay, I, I understand. Brood, the, brooder, the, yes, brooder. The basics. I mean, I, I'm all I'm all about not crashing, but Jesus, it's just yeah, sure. <laughs> Reminds yep. me of a client that was touting back in the day when I was working in an agency. It was like, oh yeah, you know, we have a 100% crash-free sessions, and I'm like, how? Oh, we just have this like uh, unhandled thread exception thing that just ignores everything. It's like. <laughs> 
Oh, no. Cool. Awesome. Cool. I mean, <laughs> works. Right. I mean, stats. <laughs> I mean, that's a bit extreme you, still. If you have a good enough web view fallback, I, I, I think that that can work. Right. <laughs> so what you're saying is that you're, you're going to rely on web views when everything else fails or? Yeah, there, there's a funny side story here somewhere from when I used to work at Uber where we had this uh, m.uber.com fallback that was really for like old devices. It's called Moober. Um, but I had like a theory that like you could just catch all exceptions. And then if that happens, open up Moober and give it like your last known state of like the ongoing ride. So it'd be like watching a YouTube video where like your quality suddenly like gets blurrier, but you're like, it still works. <laughs> and it doesn't even buffer. It's just like very smooth. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you want to, do you want to try to spin up yes. an example project here? Or would you yeah. like us to show you some of the existing examples? Yeah. Do you want to share your screen or should I clone it and try and run it locally? Uh, which would you rather? Uh, the samples we have are are good, but we don't actually have like a good like hello world sample. We have like we've counters. got three different, huh? All right. The counter's all right as a hello world, kind of. Yeah, it's a it's a multi platform hello world, um, but it is a hello world. Uh, yeah, okay. I don't know. Let's. Yeah, let's get you up and running with it. I think uh, yeah. that'll be the most. Oh, I need to yeah. the studio. Just give me a second. At least I have fast internet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just uh, toolbox is doing the toolbox thing. Uh, but yeah, so um, you were saying that there is. Oh yeah, samples. I guess is gonna be in here. Yeah. And so, a uh, quick overview of these. Um, so the STAR sample, it, STAR is an uh, acronym for it's the rescue that uh, this dog is uh, adoptable at. Um, the, you know, we wanted to have like a very simple but like realistic uh, playground app to work out of. Um, I always kind of like, I don't know, find myself wishing whenever I go look at examples that they had have something a bit more meaty um, to look at. Um, it also is a good you know, better test ground for us if we can actually have cases where like rubber really meets the road on it. Um, so it has sort of everything you would expect in a real app. Um, it's just like a, you know, simple two or three screen app, but, um, you know, it has a list, it talks to a real API, it has a storage layer, it has an authentication layer, it, um, you know, has uh, uh, multiple screens in its stack, so you can like click an animal on the list, go to a detail screen about it. You can flip through a photo carousel. You can see the full screen one. We have things in there that we also like kind of have like an eye toward. Um, yeah, we want to uh, get shared element and uh, transitions working eventually. And uh, we have ideas of like where we could put that in that sample. Um, the, uh, the counter sample um, is like a hello world uh, example of a common multi-platform uh, project. So that can run in iOS, on Android, on desktop, on JS. Um, and it's like a very simple counter presenter. And that's actually uh, probably a pretty good one to look at for like a basic presenter. Um, the interop uh, sample, which I'm seeing now is not mentioned in the readme, but it is there. Um, it's just a simple app showing how you can do interop to like, uh, you know, uh, to coroutines, to RxJava, to standard Android views. Um, that was something that was a big uh, point of, uh, uh, I don't know, on our like requirements, basically when we were working on this is like this ha has to work in the world that we live in, um, which means that we need to be able to use it and connect it to existing things in our existing app. Um, and then the taco uh, sample is one that is like explicitly showing like very complex um, presenters. Um, that's like an order food ordering wizard. So if you're you know putting together a taco, you like pick like your base and then you know the meat and the toppings, and it collects all that state and aggregates it to the end. Is the circuit equivalent of the Dagger coffee machine example? <laughs> 
<laughs> there's a there's no thermal siphon in here. But. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, at this point it has that kind of love hate kind of nostalgia to it. <laughs> uh, um, while this is importing, do you want to maybe look at the counter presenter sample? Inter yep, I was just opening yeah. it. So, I... but we we. Uh, shout out to our uh, fancy progress bar. <laughs> let's let's rem let's remind everybody that we built a, a, a progress bar plugin live on Twitch, and you can find the video here. Let's, let's actually, I'm gonna create a, a card. I just need to, to see. It's like 50 minutes in, so yeah, there is a card here <laughs> for the video. Check out the video. Nice. So. Oh, you're I'm, I'm building it to, for to... Mosaic as well. Yeah, it doesn't quite work yet because Mosaic doesn't yet support um, effects. Um, so if you want to actually navigate, um, uh, like with keyboard uh, or with key inputs, it doesn't work for that yet. But ah. there's like an implementation there that when Mosaic supports effects, that implementation should just work. Okay, um, so it's more of a periodically nag Jake kind of to do. Yeah, he did uh, comment on that issue like two days ago. So there's a, uh, it's alive. But yeah, we have this running on all the other ones. Um, JS is not listed here, but JS does work. Um, every time I try to call them multi-platform JS, I, I, I come away feeling a little scarred. Uh, not that anything's wrong with the KMP side of it, but just I don't understand what's going on in Kotlin or in uh, JavaScript. JavaScript. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so where should I start from? Common main, I guess. Common. Oh, yeah. So counter presenter. Yep. Is that? Yeah. Okay. So let me get stuff out of the way. Uh, so I guess, yeah, this uh, presenter, presenter, uh, you have screen. Okay, so direct me towards where I should start looking from. I guess the factory is the place. Yeah, so um, this counter presenter has two screens, um, basically so that we could test navigation. Like we had to come up with an excuse for a second screen. Um, so the second screen will tell you if the number is prime or not. Um, but yeah, so uh, this is an example of like a composite factory that can handle multiple screens. So it's a very simple uh, callback that it gets from circuit internals where it says, here's the screen. Can you handle it? If so, here's a navigator. Um, so screens in their presenters can call like go to or pop on the navigator for that point in the back stack. Um, and uh, context, which is like a, I don't know, it's basically kind of like a bag of uh, yeah. tags. And yeah, it's there for you to like breadcrumb stuff if you want through like circuits internals. Um, this is how we implemented tracing. Uh, if you've ever dealt with OKCDP's OK request tags, it's uh, very much like modeled off of that. Um, yeah, we can't solve for like every API that people need, but we can uh, give people a way to shuttle things through circuits internals and get them on the other side. Do I need to install Java 20? Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> you sorry. could probably lower it to 17 in um, libs.versions.toml, assuming that's what you have. Yeah. Uh, I do have 17, I think. So if you search for JDK, there you go. Yeah, if you change that to 17, I think it should be fine. Hopefully. <laughs> if it explodes, we know. We, <laughs> we know, yeah. Yeah. We use, uh, we usually chase the latest um, JDK inside of like Slack's tooling. Um, and our open source projects tend to reflect that. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, that's. Fair. I just have uh, 17 because that's the version of Java that is used in Studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's also telling me I need more RAM. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens when you download half the internet. 
um, okay. Yeah, so, so that's like a standard factory. Like mm -hmm. I was saying before, we almost never write these by hand. We do a little bit of code gen um, that lets you just annotate the actual presenter class with like at circuit inject and then tell it like what screen you want to tie it to and what scope you want to uh, contribute it to. Because we use Anvil. Um, if you're familiar with Hilt, uh, it's like similar to using the like at install in. Um, we have a PR open to add Hilt support that we're working through. Um, but this is kind of like an example of what we would generate otherwise. Um, and then this presenter factory gets added to the circuit instance. So then anytime you're in a circuit content, if you were to give it, say, a counter screen or a prime screen, um, circuit would ask this factory, hey, can you handle these? They would say yes, and they would return a presenter wrapping one of these two um, presenter composable functions, which actually is, I guess, an Another nice thing to show is you can write a presenter class or you can write a presenter composable function and we'll just wrap it up in a presenter class for you. So you can make them as simple or as complex as you want. Mm -hmm. I, I see throwing shade already here. <laughs> yeah, I think it's fixed in Iguana um, unchecked, but it's... <laughs> I mean, hopefully. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, for example, let's look at the counter presenter, I guess. Um, so I, I see no names over here. <laughs> so yeah. if you uh, so you just have this composable function and it takes in a navigator and it returns a screen state. Um, so it might actually it might actually be better if we if you click on that counter screen class first, if we go through that. Sure. Yeah. So this is yeah. an example of like how we start a screen. Um, normally, they're uh, an object or, uh, or sorry, a data object or a data class. And here, they're an interface because of a bug in Compose Multi-Platform or Kotlin Multi-Platform, one of the two. Um, but this is generally how they look. We define the screen at the top. It extends circuit screen. Uh, if it's a just a screen with no inputs, then it's just a data object. If you have inputs, like you, you know, if it's the uh, favorite screen, you want to pass in maybe like the user ID to see whose favorites it is. You would mm -hmm. pass that in as a property, and then we define the state and events uh, usually as subtypes in here uh, for simple screens. If you have a complex one, you can define them as their own top level things. Um, but you know, for a counter screen, the state and uh, events are pretty simple. So you've got the current count, um, an event sync, which we'll get to in a second, and uh, then the uh, event uh, types, which we usually do as a uh, sealed uh, class hierarchy of the different event types you can get. So increment, decrement, or uh, navigation event if someone clicks like the prime screen. Mm -hmm. um, this event sync on line 53 is uh, an example of what I mentioned uh, early on as like a, a thing that we do that's a bit different than your sort of standard MVI UDF setup where we circuit doesn't shuttle events uh, for you as part of the framework. Instead, you define these syncs in your state and then your UI can pass events to that. So it's like a, here's the state and then it gives you like, here's like call me back with any sort of like event that comes through. So you can have state that handles different types of events, or you can have state that doesn't accept events. So say like a loading event, it doesn't make sense to be able to like click buttons on the screen if nothing is being shown on the screen. Got it. Okay, yeah, just uh, set nah. the app running. Uh, it, it will eventually work, I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, and then if you go back to that counter presenter, yes. Uh, this is where we basically pull all that together. So you've got your count variable, uh, just a simple state, uh, and we are incrementing it or decrementing it, um, and we return an instance of the state. So uh, we return this uh, counter screen dot state with the current count, uh, and then we have this trailing event sync. So it looks really nice, and you see it kind of like spins off. 
decide, the event comes through, and then based on the event, we update the state. And you may notice that this is a circuit. <laughs> so it's, it's going in a loop. I see where the name no, comes that's from. The name. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So as soon as it launches, which should be now ish, pick the right one. Yeah. Okay. So essentially, what happened now is that the uh, the presenter factory was called. And it was asked to create the counter screen, right? Uh, and then the counter presenter was, well, the presenter of counter presenter was returned. And now it's been initialized with value zero, which is what we see here. And then if I start clicking around, then it, it would invoke the, the sync that we've defined here, right? So I can go, aha, I can make it red. I can go. You, Sebastiano went, went full QA lead <laughs> engineer like in an instant. Uh, surprised you haven't rotated yet. Yeah. I, that's a good point. Is, well, I mean, he's Ooh. gonna also run it on a foldable in a minute if you if you wait <laughs> enough, he's gonna run it on a foldable. I mean, I do have. Yeah, Team sure. No, please don't, Sebastiano. Please don't. Give, <laughs> give, give people a break. These are friends. I know, I know. There's nobody here talking about window size glasses yet, so it's fine. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. I mean, he will, he will tell you, throw everything in a view model. <laughs> um, Okay. So, but it's very peculiar. The, I'm still thinking about the the events in the state as a mm. as a lambda. That's uh, that's actually yeah. very peculiar. I I am curious about the the reasoning behind that. It's more like a probably like a interesting story that, that because usually you just have. I mean, I haven't been doing the state, and then you have like a send event call like method on the view model since oh forever i mean since we started doing things a bit more like mvi ish e thingy udf so i never thought but then you know i also had in the past i also had coming from the view model i had state and i also had actions like you know show a snack bar that's not like a more like a state more like a like a command like an action that i was from the view model telling the ui and then we had Manuel, you know, a few months ago over, he was, we were discussing uh, unidirectional data flow and he told me, yeah, but that could be in the state, right? So, you know, I also changed my view about how to do this thing. Now that you are presenting this, oh, there is only the state and then a couple of callbacks, I guess, I mean, I can, I can fit, it's one, one call, callback and then you have an event as a seed class, right? Am I correct? So it's just one yep. function that, that that you call with different things. So it's basically replacing the method that I have on the view model with a function in the state object. So that's the idea, right? But how yeah. did you end up with something like that? Why? I mean, why? And, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm generally curious. I, 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 think, I think it works because, and you are proving that it works, right? Even from a cognitive point of view, um, from, how you you onboard people on this, and they, they I guess they are, they will ask, right? <laughs> like so, a, a genuine, a genuine, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, for so, that. That's... so there's uh, there's technical reasons, and then there's like developer ergonomics reasons. Um, uh, I should mention also that this idea was Adam Powell's idea, so um, please uh, send your hate mail to him. Um, right. But we also really like the idea. The, so, so here's the bit on the technical side. So when we were first uh, prototyping this, we actually initially did it um, with uh, you know, a more standard UDF setup where like you had uh, a flow uh, of events coming back into the presenter and that was passed in as like a parameter. Um, and then you just return state and nothing else. Um, and then on the UI side of it, you would get uh, sort of the same thing. You would get like state, uh, but then you, instead of having it be a property in uh, 
the state, you would have a separate parameter that was like an event sync that was again just like a callback. Um, the way that that was implemented under the hood in Circuit is using a. Uh, initially, we tried doing a shared flow, and then weird things happened, and then we changed it to uh, just a simple channel, and it it worked, but it was actually sort of like a an annoying headache. And there is an actual potential for like dropping events in between that like handoff of like states going this way. And then the channel is not yet ready to receive things back from the UI. Um, and the overhead of that was, um, you know, not zero. Um, but then uh, with this approach, it's just a direct dispatch coming back. Like there's no uh, coroutines machinery that it has to go through or that circuit has to set up. Um, this is just a very standard, simple Kotlin function. Um, I should mention that uh, someone from uh, Cash App did a prototype of this on their side and measured it and found, I think, a meaningful uh, like uh, performance uh, difference that they could profile. But I don't have any numbers handy for that. Um, but it was sort of like a recurring headache trying to get this to actually work correctly because you want it to essentially be almost synchronous. But because it's going through these coroutine like gateways, it ended up having I don't know issues that we we were not a fan of. Um, on the developer ergonomic side of things, where this gets actually really really nice is that your uh, your UI can only now emit event events that are accepted by the current state. So a very classic example of this is like you have a loading screen, um, and when that screen is loading or showing. There's nothing else that you can do. Like you don't have any buttons on the screen, or maybe you have like an exit button, uh, something like that, and that's sort of it. And whenever you have a event sync parameter uh, in there, the UI can freely emit uh, events to that, and you have this sort of like ability to create scenarios that don't actually match your state. Like I'm showing a loading screen, and somehow the user clicked next, or things that's like that. And very clever. Yeah, and where we actually saw this benefit immediately was whenever we switched to this pattern, we found tests in Circuit that were testing incomprehensible scenarios where like events would come through, and we're like, that's actually not possible with this state. Um, so it ended up kind of like it it catches those kinds of issues out the gate, and it also prevents you from accidentally writing tests that create those scenarios. Um, if you look at uh, if you search for uh, pet list test or pet detail test, yeah, the pet detail presenter test. Um, so this is a good example of how this looks to actually test in practice, which I guess we should talk about a bit too, but mm -hmm. just to uh, if you go down to the second test where it emits. This is just JVM, right? So this is like a unit test. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, I think one of these must do an event test. It might be the pet list presenter test. Um, or maybe the third test. Yeah, the whole thing is frozen. I'm not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, what's what ends up being really nice in these tests is that you await a state and you get it back and you assert, you know, that it's a state of a certain type, and then you can proceed your presenter state by just calling that event sync function to it, and it's just a synchronous uh, transaction. And your test, you can't write a, an event that can't happen in that state because your code just won't compile. But this is actually, this is very, so very, I like a lot the idea of constraining the events on the state. Because, yeah. you know, what I usually do, you know, the, the whole idea of having a SIL class for the state was from a domain modeling point of view. Now Sebastian is going gonna, is gonna to troll me on this. From a domain modeling point of view, <laughs> you won't state that cannot you you want to be 
unable to represent impossible states, right? So at some point, you know, things that need to be mutually exclusive. Like if it's loading, there is no content, right? So you can't have the fucking progress bar on the list anymore, right? So we we are better than that. So, you know, 10, five, six years ago, you had the list and then you have the progress bar because there was a is loading Boolean going around and now you have, like, you have content. And then the focus shifted, okay, the state has to be very rigorous and you don't, um, you, you don't, you, you can't represent impossible state. I'm preventing you from a Kotlin point of view. Yeah. But the events always slip through because you're correct, right? I mean, if it's well, loading, we... I can send you shit, right? I mean, if I yeah. work with... If I work with assholes, I mean, people can do the weirdest stuff, right? But now, if I, I mean, that's why because I hate people, right? But from a from a generally <laughs> uh, computer science point of view, you are moving a step forward on the domain modeling, you know, pushing the thing. I'm constraining the events that you can generate to the state that you are in. This is yeah. very clever. I love it. You, you oh, man. You fucking... now, I need, now, I, now I need to do this stuff in my, in my head. Fuck me. Uh, <laughs> that's why I hate coming. Oh, man. This, this is good. Oh, man. Oh. It's just kind it's of like, like, good stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's, and this is super valuable in production code because you just immediately yeah. scope everything down to like the problem you're solving in each of those states. And yeah, we use all the time. Like in circuit, we don't prescribe you having an event sync at all. So you can have none for like the loading screen, or you could have one for your main list screen, or say like your main list screen also has like an extra menu. You could have two event syncs in there if you wanted, and those are each handling different event flows. So yeah, it's super, super valuable to correctly model the whole scope of the thing. There is one big wart on it that is is fair to point out, um, which is that people really like being able to like assert that state is equal to expected state and call it a day. But if we're if you're using a function, functions don't implement that equality, so your tests aren't as nice to write that way. But we also haven't heard that many complaints internally with people having to write tests where you like assert individual things about the state properties coming through. But we might someday write like a, I don't know, a helper utility that can like decompose your data class and then uh, assert every assert equality for everything but the function. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Or I mean, uh, you can solve it as I do. I don't write tests, so that's also. <laughs> so that. I don't. Yeah. I don't have the. I don't have the issue. I mean, it's like you know, if you don't write tests, you don't have the problem, right? With the assert. See. Yeah. It's a. Uh, I'm kidding. Don't write this at home. People write tests. <laughs> I'm, I'm teaching. I'm teaching Kotlin to a, a group of Python developers. Man, I'm struggling with the basic stuff. I, so this is a type. <laughs> so if you have types, you write fewer unit tests <laughs> because I get, the compiler can check shit for you, right? So let's start with that. <laughs> so you know, I, 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 I'm really fun. I'm just kidding about testing. Do testing. Um, Sebastiano, yes, I feel I feel that the struggle. What's going on? I gave too much RAM to Studio. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, uh, going to Hedgehog. <laughs> Hopefully that works. Uh, but yeah, so yeah. on. So after we are done with the um, uh, with the state presenter here. Uh, I guess there is a counterpart for generating the UI, but does that uh, does that take like I guess is this one common common counter UI? Yeah. So yeah. this uh, just gets probably, your uh, your state from the presenter. It's okay. just a composable mm -hmm. function, like okay. standard composable function. Gets your state, and then you just go build your normal compose UI. So. Does it take a modifier because it can be just a subset of a screen? It could be like a... the the circuit content composable that you set up earlier that you give your screen to takes a modifier and that modifier gets passed through down to the screen or like the UI here. So that's where that modifier is coming from. Okay. Um... 
Yeah, the rest is just so, uh, normal. So, but how do you how do you plug this into the, in the activity? Sorry, I I missed that. So because I the comp the presenter is uh, composable and you have you have a factory. I, I will force probably I, I missed that as well. But how do you start from an activity set content point of view? What what's the entry point, Sebastian? I'm sorry, I was clicking away notifications. What did you say? Don't <laughs> don't worry. Can you show me the main activity, please? Uh, if you go to counter activity. Uh, is there one? Yeah, I think it's up in the it'll be an apps directory. Oh. Here's yeah, okay. search for it. Okay, so here you also have the builder. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah. this is the entry point from the Android world. Right. This so is, you yeah. build the, the circuit and then you so the um, the ad presenter factory, you only have the first one, right? So you don't have the 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 detail, the prime number one. So you just add the the first one. The I mean, the, in this case, that counter presenter factory is handling both the okay. counter and the prime. Normally, if they're two distinct screens, then yeah, there'd be two different factories you'd add. Ah, okay. So you do you do like add presenter, add presenter, add presenter for as many you need, basically. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, then you have a circuit composition local and line forty one, I think. Yeah, which yeah. is what we saw. And, and you, pass, you pass yeah. the circuit, and then you, now you have circuit content with the Android counter screen. Where is the Android counter screen declared? What, what's? Yeah, so this is the weird thing that I was saying before. Um, we have to define the counter screen as an interface in the common one because of a bug. I think it's a bug in a, a Compose multi-platform where it doesn't. Yeah, there's the comment. It, for some reason, even though counter screen extends parcel or sorry, screen extends parcelable um, on the Android target. For some reason, that doesn't get carried over when you actually write a screen in common somewhere else. Um, I believe that that's something that they're going to make work now. It was a whole, yeah, it was a whole discussion going into Kotlin 1.9.2 where they initially completely blocked this behavior, and we were like, "Hey, this completely breaks our project. Could we not do this?" Um, and uh, they. Uh, are changing course on it and uh, going to do work to make this kind of thing possible. But for now, yeah, we have to just make this separate screen just to make it uh, compile correctly. But this is not a normal case you would have to do. OK. Yeah, it and the basically, this is yeah. it's basically it will be like calling counter screen, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you have the common one, and then you have different implementations for Android, iOS, desktop, whatever. Because um, then here you have, yeah, JS, JVM. And I guess there is a, yes. Just want to see. <laughs> I have the, the bad habit of going or checking the desktop stuff. Let's see. Uh, but yeah, it's just a normal compose for desktop setup. And then you have the theme. The, yeah, OK. So uh, we have about 10, 15 minutes left. Do, do you want to cover uh, navigation, like the navigatable circuit? Yes, content, please. Uh, yes, stuff please. that I see here. I, I, I don't really know what it is. so. Sure. Um, Did you run back. it on desktop? Ah, this is cool. <laughs> is it is it using Jewel? No, it's not. <laughs> See the ripples? <laughs> is it intended that it loses the count when you go back? Okay. Yeah. So if you if you want to do a fun live demo here, yes. Go back to the counter presenter and change that remember to remember retained, and then it'll work. This one. Yeah. yeah. And then run again. And let's see if it opens it on the right screen. Probably not. Yeah. So it's a live demo. It'll probably break, but. 
So six is not a prime. Yeah, it works. Woo! Boom! Nailed it. That's pretty nice. So now I can just do this, and then do this, and then do this. Ah, it's really nice. I really like it. It's um, it's lovely how this is the difference between <laughs> sanity and insanity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's like oh, it worked from it works to what the fuck is going on? Like with <laughs> you know with very close teeth. Like <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I love it. I mean, it's going to be like a bit of machinery behind the magic that you were talking about. So it's, I don't think it's that easy. There you go. Oh. Eh? Eh? Yeah. Yeah. No, don't. don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's, why would you do that? I mean, they already done it. So why would you do that? I'm curious. Okay. I, mean, I regretted yeah, oh, no, my no, no, decision no. very quickly, but. <laughs> it's like, you, I can't refrain from clicking. And then I was like. <laughs> but that's a composed mindset. When you when you're using something, you want to know it works. Just control click until you get to the click point where you're really. like, I have no idea what's happening here. Yeah, <laughs> this is this is very very far from my comfort zone. Let's yeah. go back. <laughs> the same thing works from from a um, from a retained point of view. It works the same on on. On Android, right? So I can go like yes. how many screens can can I go? Like n? There is a, like a a limit. Can I, can I? How? I mean, the the stack. How would it work if I go through I like an onboarding? Put a limit on it so you can go through it all the way, and it'll retain it and go back. Something like an onboarding, though, you're gonna want to maybe reset that stack. And part of the navigator yeah. lets you do that. You can reset to hey, I've done my set new route and jump around. So that's given to you in the navigator, but that retained state is going to be there. So you can come back and check it out. You are rotating the device, Sebastian. <laughs> no, I'm I'm wondering why it started the API 29 app instead of the API 32. You have to you have to test on a, like a broader, you know, set of devices, Sebastian. Uh okay. Yeah. So how do I navigate? So there is a navigator yes. yeah. top that I see. Uh, so you go back to the counter presenter. I can show you. Yes. So we get the navigator here. Uh, that is yeah. passed in. Yeah, and that's uh, that's set up in the navigable circuit content, and that's kind of shared across all the presenters. Builds into your back stack, again, a bunch of magic in the background, but really easy interface on the front of it where you can go to a new screen, you can pop back a screen, or you can reset sort of your root screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just like yeah. very, very small just for the interface. Basis. Nice. Super clean. And that's it's it. And the so basic, but that's what you, what you need, right? I mean, that's what you need. Yeah. At least I don't. I, at least I don't have to check every time on Stack Overflow how do I reset or pop or whatever, and then and it's yeah. is it this this screen? Is it still on this? Is it this screen? The first one, or I'm losing also this one when I go back. You will never know, right? With the, no. I, I will always check. Is it okay? Is it where where is it resetting? Is it contained or not? It's like inclusive, not inclusive kind of thing, right? <laughs> like okay. And the event yeah. dot screen that I see there, is it yeah like something that it's built in? Because now I'm uh, I see the the struggle with the naming because of the screen and the, the screens. So this is just like a generic event. So if we put another button on the counter screen here for another screen, we could just give it it the uh, a new circuit screen to go to. Are you suggesting? So just, that's just the event. <laughs> we have to add a new screen, but you could copy. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it's going to look the same, but so we well, need. I mean, to... you can change the icon and instead to... of remove. I'm just going to create an even event so that sure. we can see how quickly it happens. Okay. So uh, now, what I need to do to add a new destination, I need to handle it, I guess, in here, obviously. Uh, here, uh, exhaust uh, the uh, went. Exhaust the went. <laughs> So, so this will just be real quick. Mm -hmm. 
that uh, the Android counter uh, UI doesn't do navigation. We just haven't added it. So you want to do this in the desktop one. All uh, right. Okay. So uh, this is a common counter. I'm just going to uh, desktop counter circuit. Okay. And... The UI is in the right place. I just mean to test it. You need to do it in oh. the desktop one. Oh, okay. You mean running it. Okay, fine. And here, I just need to handle this, and I guess I can do... Navigator, I guess. Uh, yeah. To... Um, and dot screen, I guess. Uh, yeah, but I need to define... But now you need to f follow the red. So how do you do the dot screen on the... Line 31, how do you do the, this? Oh, I just, because that would be a good tool, so I don't need a separate one. one. But I can, I, can yeah. just, I guess, just log something. That would be fine as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Don't know where the logs can spit that out, but yeah. Uh, what? Yeah, because this is the generic one, I think. All right. Print yeah. line something. Yeah. Okay, so oops, I can run this. You said on desktop. Uh, yes. I'm pretty sure that desktop uses the same common UI. We'll find out very soon. Find out, yeah. Uh, sure. It does not actually. Okay. So yeah, I need to add that button somewhere else. Which I, I guess might have been desktop car circuit. Uh, uh, if here. you click into counter UI factory on um, line one thirty six. So okay, yeah, we do have a different one on desktop. So yeah, that first one. Yeah, this one. Ah, okay, okay. So this would be this one. Ah, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, here you go. Making a mental note, we should bring these together. This, this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Diverged a little somewhere. Is there a question mark? No. It has to be. Come on, ask. Try, try ask. I'll go check. Whatever, check. whatever works is fine. <laughs> and then <laughs> even here, and then I can run this again oh, i don't need this anymore i can just run the desktop app and theoretically okay the button is there and then nice. i need to see if it does print yeah Woo! wow okay <laughs> it works nice okay um someone and, asking in yeah. uh, in the chat when are we gonna make a multi-platform app with kotlin who is we <laughs> If you mean us, like me as Ivan and Sebastiano, I mean, it's a... I don't know. Well, <laughs> sure. I mean, we, we keep having people over, so there is very little coding on our app lately. I mean, I've got uh, it now. But this is cool. Almost yeah, yeah, no sure. Bugs. I mean, you can call it, you can call it a day. Um, uh, I was yeah, going to say, cool. Josh, do you, do you want to take them through some of the like internals of like either like navigable circuit content or the retain stuff? Um, sure. Yeah. Remember where we put it. Uh, retain, did we have retained. this one, right? The, the scary stuff I shouldn't have control clicked into. You should jump into. <laughs> Let's jump into it. Yeah. Yay. So the the main way that this works is there's this retained state registry that sort of shove all these values into under the hood. On Android, that's a view model. I forget what we did on desktop. Um, like my I think it's just a. I think it's just like a, a singleton object. Okay. Any singleton yeah. to rescue. There. Uh, but this tracks all these retained values uh, in, in composition based on where they are and all that. 
and um, so we can kind of keep it all. And then there's again some more stuff with our navigation goes together where this gets keyed and remembered with a particular screen you're on. So that's how we can remember each sort of screen and each of the retained states on each of those mm. screens going through. Uh, so you have like the composite key hash. Do I want to know? <laughs> <laughs> Should so I ask? <laughs> it, it tells you where you are in the, in the compose world. That's the nice way to say that. Okay. But this will this the, the remember retain works exactly like a normal remember, where there's particular inputs that it will base off of, and then when those change, it'll recalculate. But we can also give it um, with remember retain a specific key, and so based oh, okay. on that key, you can put stuff into the retained state registry and then somewhere else you can pull that value out with that key mm -hmm. and that can be really powerful for as Zach said earlier oh, okay. pulling values around what, what was that Zach that was freaky <laughs> the dog what happened no no, no there oh. was, I, I saw like you did this and there was like a overlay pop-up of a thumbs up thing I, I have no idea Skype, Skype, Skype doing Skype. <laughs> what the hell? Oh, wait, are you on? I think uh... this is the new Mac thing. Yeah, that's I was going like, yeah, you got reactions on. Yeah, yeah, wow. that's that's a new level of cringe. <laughs> Yikes! It's uh, oh, overkill. Yeah, on yeah. my default, that's a move. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. like the new feature in Sonoma that if you click the wallpaper, then it shows all the windows. Very intuitive. It's like, what? <laughs> Why? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who comes up with this stuff? I don't, I will never understand. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. Well, imagine imagine the, the spring planning, right? So, so <laughs> this next two weeks, we need to build this. Yeah, Mike asking oh, in the chat if it can be disabled. Yes. I think also the effects can be disabled. Uh, oh, yeah. You'll get confetti if you show peace signs in both hands. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Wow, this <laughs> is, is so wild. Wow. I don't this know. Is... What, what... Now, now I'm curious. <laughs> what else? If you do like a heart shape or something, do you get heart anything? Heart should work. Like a heart? heart should work. No. You're, you're like, not triggering the, the machine learning. <laughs> Like this. Yeah. Try this. Try this. No. That's a. That's a. Ah, oh go. my God! <laughs> he also he also picks the position. Wow. I mean, we are burning through forest for this bullshit. Wow. Oh, wow. That Greta is very happy about this machine learning. Yeah. You know that we are doing. Anyway, so, sorry for the digression. So, so where were we? Uh... <laughs> Okay, Maya, stop suggesting things to do. <laughs> we'll never finish this stream otherwise. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I, I, I understand how it works now, the, the retain stuff. Um, was there anything else you wanted to add on that? Because we're kind of out of time, otherwise we can uh, consider wrapping up. But if, there's a, if there is something else that you want to talk about, then now is your time. As if Chad wanna... would say, is there anything we forgot to ask? <laughs> now, if you if you want to open up, um, this kind of dovetails nicely with navigable circuit content. If you want to open that up, um, so like circuit content itself is a fairly simple composable function. All it does is reach into the circuit object, and I'm like, hey. I've got this screen. Give me a presenter that works with it and a UI that works with it, and I'll connect those two together. But then navigable circuit content, uh, which I think is in a separate file. So this is the one that does some magic with um, basically moving across the back stack. And uh, this implementation is based on one uh, that Adam Powell wrote and shared with us. Um, but the gist of it is we have uh, sort of like active content providers on each uh, screen that we like uh, store and pop back onto um, 
as the current top screen on the stack changes. And we observe that in a live way. So whenever you navigate and you say like, go to, what's actually happening is you are just telling the back stack that there is now a new screen on the top mm -hmm. and then everything else in here adjusts for that to show the new top of the back stack. And then whenever you pop off, it adjusts back to show the previous content that was on there. We also have a little bit of a notion in here of what we call uh, uh, nav decorations, um, which is sort of like a toehold for doing transitions. We have basic ones in there right now, but nothing like a shared element transition or anything. But this is sort of like the last major piece of the API that we want to try to iron out once the upstream compose animation APIs um, have a bit more time to develop. Um, but this is sort of like the real, I don't know, bit of like magic area in circuit that like you're just sort of almost observing the back stack um, and the content that is on it, that it's key to a record on the back stack. And whenever you're traversing it, all you're doing is just poking the top and uh, that back stack or popping all the way down. Um, and this is just observing whatever the current top is. Um, it works really nice in practice, and it means that it's very easy to just get a new, you know, back stack navigable area of your app. Um, and it also kind of, I don't want to say it like scales infinitely, but it's very easy to go and just like drop in a new navigable surface in say like, uh, you know, you got like the pixel fold and like you could, you know, have two, uh, halves of your screen and you can make this part navigable and that part can be drilled into while this part stays, uh, on its own stack. And it's just, it's very nice how simple it ends up being for like a developer working within it. Um, yeah, anything yeah, pretty much you... don't think about navigation when you're developing on it just because it's all here and it's like an observed composed state, like your own back stack on your state you're building off of. It's very good. Yeah, it takes, it seems like it takes a lot of the mental strain out of the picture, uh, which I don't know if it was an explicit goal, but <laughs> it, it, it seems yeah. to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, I think we can wrap up now. Is there, or is there anything else? Because uh, you keep coming up with good, good stuff. <laughs> so I, I'm gonna no, ask actually, again. I have. I I I want to ask one last question because sure. you you say that um, this is being adopted incrementally in Slack. Um, so is it, I don't know how big it's the team or how I think it's massive. The, the, the app is massive or things like that. So how, how do you relate with the other teams that maybe that don't have this, um, uh, yet or anymore? I don't want to sound negative, but, <laughs> um, how, how does it work? Are you constantly trying to sell to other teams? From uh, you, you, Josh mentioned, you know, the political. Uh... Yeah, I think there was like there's this started as, as an internal plan to build out our new architecture. There's general agreement from the majority of the team at the time to start down that path, and so now we're kind of there's, there's a good starting place in that sense, and then stuff happens, but we're back on track, and we're working more as a team now to figure out how we take our existing MVP architecture. There's some internal interop to like migrate that over. So we've committed to this being the architecture across the team that we're going to use going forward. There's a lot of just sort of like massaging old code into the new designs. And then we do some internal stuff to promote it and demonstrate it and help people out and champion it as well. So it's a lot of Josh's team coming in with really cool, fancy demos. They're like, oh, I did this in like a couple well, of days with my demo. <laughs> I think that in a way that did help like we did one team that was dedicated to trying this out first and finding the warts and, and fixing all of that and then building patterns because again this is a new mm -hmm. architecture you got to find what works and what doesn't work and build those patterns and share those patterns yeah. it turns out all of slack is just bottom sheets that that's been 50, 50 <laughs> to 60 percent of of all the internal assets, how do I how do I put this in a bottom sheet and how do I get a value back out of it to my fragment? Um, yeah, 
yeah, it's a lot of that. <laughs> so it's uh, architecture optimized for bottom sheets, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Inter internally, uh, another colleague of ours who is also one of the maintainers on the project, uh, Kieran, um, built this really neat. Um, so we have like our old legacy navigation, and we have this like very cool but very like behind the scenes interop where you can pass in. A say like a screen that looks like a circuit screen key, but then under the hood, we have this intercepting navigator that when it sees it, will like boot out the circuit bit and go back to uh, whatever the like vintage legacy screen is. Um, I don't want to say it short circuits it, but you know, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he has this like, he had to build this very special API called like navigator dot, exit circuit with result because this bottom sheet scenario kept bottom coming sheets. up over and over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've done a lot of interrupt and it works. So nice. Nice, nice, nice. Sebastian. I'm You're, I'm done. It, it's I'm, your time I'm to happy. shine. I'm happy uh, and I, I have things to try in the next few weeks. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for, for being with us. Uh, thank you for being with us in the chat, even if the chat didn't show the stream for side problems, I think. It turns so, out it's hard to fit four people and the chat on a vertical column without having the people yeah. this speak and the chat this speak. Fair enough. So uh, if you if you followed live, thank you for being with us. If you're watching this on YouTube, remember to like, subscribe. Um, you can support us. And ring, the bell, ring, the ring the bell. Ring the bell. Ring the bell. Ring also <laughs> ring the bell. Uh, <laughs> smash the like button. How was it, Mark? That's Mark, too much. That's too much. Like <laughs> anyway, um, jokes aside, thank you for the support. If you have an Amazon Prime subscription, you can subscribe for free. If you connect it to your Twitch account, you will see that there is a new uh, switch on the UI. It says subscribe for free, and you can support us. With the Twitch subscription, you can support us buying things on our uh, merch store that you will see, by the way, below your YouTube videos because we did it. I mean, we we <laughs> we matured to one of those channels with the store below the videos. Uh, you can buy also the the keychains and you can buy the um, the stickers. You can become a subscriber on Coffee if you want and a subscription to Coffee. I think the Bruschetta tier will allow you also to join the Discord server. And with the Discord server, you can access the post episode chat with the guests. So if you're interested in uh, meeting people um, in the in the chat, just uh, you, you give, forgot give to it say touch. the most important thing is that we make the stupid thumbnails for YouTube in the after show. Yes, during <laughs> during the yeah, you will see. Okay, let's sell it better. So you will see the creative process that Sebastiano uh, shows every week when he builds the, the, the clickbait thumbnails uh, while Mark Ellison is trolling him. So yeah. that's, uh, <laughs> that's something that you, if you are into that kind of stuff, uh, think about it. Um, Josh, Zach, thank you again. This was very, very, very interesting. Yes. And yeah, I think it's going to be a great addition to our, our playlist. So thank you for being with us. And thank you for building this because it looks very cool. And I'm very looking forward to try it out. I, I need an excuse now, <laughs> some project that I can try it out on. And I'm like, I'm already scheming even. Yes, <laughs> yes, I know. I mean, if we, if we could stop if only we had spare time. with the idea. <laughs> oh man, I mean, we need to stop the building shit. I mean, I, I want to do garden more, garden, yeah. more garden. <laughs> anyway, um, beautiful people. Yeah, well, ah, gardening, hashtag gardening, hashtag blessed. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think this is going to grow any vegetables, but it's green. Yeah, uh, that counts. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we're going to see everyone next week. Uh, we have someone you might have heard of, Jake Wharton, I think his name. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. We are going to ask about mosaic. I'm gonna, no, we're not. So. I'm going to ask us about. So, did you did you add the, the effects in mosaic? Because I'm waiting. Because I'm asking for a friend. I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> so if I was trying could, this thing last up. week, coincidentally, and <laughs> there yeah. was a to do there. Yeah, <laughs> that said, you had to do something. Uh, yeah. But no, he's going to come and talk about molecule. So uh, that's the mm. theoretically the topic of the. Of the stream, then we'll see if you manage to hijack it even. <laughs> well, uh, molecule is is awesome, and that's actually yeah. we didn't really get into tests that much about uh, circuit, but that's how circuits testing infrastructure uh, is powered. Nice, molecule and turbine are really really good. Yeah. So yeah, we have a pretty sweet uh, November lineup. I'm very happy, <laughs> and there is. Yeah, you you will not want to miss next week nor the following week either. Um, so I'm, I'm yeah, you're gonna sit in the in the end screen now. But yeah, we're gonna have py and we're gonna talk about leak cannery the following week. So we have two performance and two compose ish <laughs> dreams this month. That counts, right? It counts. Yeah. yeah it uh, counts. If there's a composable annotation, then it counts. That's the rule. <laughs> very very vague <laughs> okay everyone uh zach josh thank you again for being here and uh folks see you next week have a good one bye oh no <laughs> <laughs> that's